the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, for the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant that in that same spirit we may be truly wise, and never rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, so I've got all this stuff out today. We're going to talk about the vestments. Um, I'm going to read to you from the Bible. Actually, I'm going to read to you from my iPad, but it's from the Bible. Um, it's from Ecclesiasticus chapter 50. It's talking about the high priest Simon. He shone in his days as the morning star in the midst of a cloud, and as the moon at the full. And as the sun when it shineth, so did he shine in the temple of God. And as the rainbow giving light in the bright clouds, and as the flower of roses in the days of the spring, and as the lilies that are on the brink of the water, and as the sweet-smelling frankincense in the time of summer, as a bright fire and frankincense burning in the fire, as a massive vessel of gold adorned with every precious stone, as an olive tree budding forth, and a cypress tree rearing itself on high, when he put on the robe of glory and was clothed with the perfection of power. And when he went up to the holy altar, he honored the vesture of holiness. And when he took the portions out of the hands of the priest, he himself stood by the altar. And about him was the ring of his brethren, as the cedar planted in Mount Libanus. And as the branches of palm trees, they stood round about him, and as the sons of Aaron in their glory, and the oblation of the Lord was in their hands before all the congregation of Israel and finishing his service on the altar to honor the offering of the most high ring. He stretched forth his hand to make a libation and offered the blood of the grape. He poured out at the foot of the altar a divine odor to the most high prince. Then the sons of Aaron shouted, they sounded with beaten trumpets and made a great noise to be heard for a remembrance before God. Then all the people together made haste and fell down on the earth upon their faces to adore their Lord God and to pray to the Almighty God the Most High. And the singers lifted up their voices and in a great house the sound of sweet melody was increased. And the people in prayer besought the Lord the Most High until the worship of the Lord was perfected, and they had finished their office. Then coming down, he lifted up his hands over all the congregation of the children of Israel to give glory to God with his lips and to the glory of his name. And he repeated his prayer and willingly showed the power of God. That is a description of the liturgy at that time. An amazing description of a liturgy which basically blew the mind of the author. And he was finding all these different ways to describe how beautiful the vestments were of the priest, how beautiful were the ceremonies, how intense, and how that was for them the face of God. That was as closest as they could get to God. So it's important to have special vestments for the Mass. It's important that they be solemn, that they be beautiful, that they be rich, and and ever since the beginning of the church, they would take, in the beginning of the church, they had clothes that were very similar, or the same, as clothes that were worn by um, the people at the time. But they would uh, 
have those clothes set apart and they would be made out of special materials and they would only be worn for mass. Pope Saint Stephen I in about the year 250 made a rule requiring clerics not to wear the vestments for mass on the street. And they say that he did that not as a beginning of this rule, but to reinforce a rule that had already been in place in the church for many years. But people had grown lax in it, and some of the clerics were wearing the vestments on the street. And so he made that rule to reinforce that, that the vestments should not be worn on the street. Let's go through the vestments and uh, talk about the different vestments and what they mean. I'll start off with the cassock. The cassock is what the priest wears. Uh, he should wear it all the time. It is permitted uh, on the street for the priest to wear what they call the clerical garb or the, uh, the clerical suit rather. So it's your pants and the uh, suit jacket. Um, but the official garb of the priest in which the Vatican has come out a couple times now in the past several years and reinforced the official garb of the priest is the cassock. The cassock is black. The color of black is the opposite to the color of white. Actually, neither one of them are colors. One of them is the absence of color and the other one is the fullness of all color. Um, but at any rate, white symbolizes life. The opposite of white is black and that symbolizes death. And so the cassock symbolizes death. And the priest is covered by the cassock from his head to his feet, which means that the priest is completely dead. And what is the priest completely dead to? The priest is completely dead to the world. Exactly. So that is what the, the cassock symbolizes, that the priest is in the world, but not of the world. He is dead to the world. It has 33 buttons. The 33 buttons represent the life of our Lord. And on the cuffs, he has five buttons, which represents the uh, five wounds of our Lord. White for purity, the color, and the sash for chastity. That is the cassock. Next thing we can look at would be the beretta. Oh, actually, let me back up a bit. Give me a second. This battery pack is not plugged in and it's distracting me. Sorry about that. There are two different meanings for the vestments. There are two kinds of meanings for the vestments. One of them would be the allegorical meaning, and the other would be the moral meaning. So they all have symbolism. Everything in the Mass has symbolism. The allegorical meaning would be to symbolize what instrument of Christ's suffering the vestment means because, as I've mentioned before, the holy sacrifice of the Mass is the representation of Calvary. And Christ is the, the, the priest at every Mass. The priest who is celebrating the Mass is standing as a proxy to Christ. He's standing in the place of Christ. The Christ is the celebrant at every Mass. And so it is fitting that the vestments worn represent uh, the instruments of our Lord's torture as he was going to Calvary. So when the priest puts the vestments on, those instruments of torture are symbolized that our Lord himself carried to Calvary to, uh, to, offer the first, uh, to offer the sacrifice for the first time on Calvary. So they have allegorical meanings. And they also have moral meanings. The moral meaning would be the meaning of the particular virtue that the priest should have in imitation of our Lord. Or the virtue that our Lord expresses at Holy Mass as priest and victim. So there are two meanings to the different vestments. I'll also go through the different prayers that are prayed uh, as the priest vests. So the first vestment The 
The first vestment would be the amos. The amos is, it's like a napkin. It's made out of linen. And um, it is worn around the neck. But when the priest places it on, he places it on his head first. Rests it on his head for a few seconds and then wraps it around his neck. And then as, as he does that, he says a prayer. The prayer that he prays, translated into English, would be, Place upon me, O Lord, the helmet of salvation, that I may overcome the assaults of the devil. The allegorical symbolism of the Amos would be the blindfold that they blindfolded our Lord with in the court of, of Caiaphas and then they buffeted him and spat on him and mocked him and said prophesy unto us who is it that struck thee so that is what it symbolizes as far as the moral signification it signifies a helmet uh, that's why you place it on your head slightly when you're putting it on Monks, when they put it on, will put it over their cowl. Their, their, the cowl is the correct name for a hood. So the monk would put up the hood, he'd place the amos over the hood, tie it like that, and then when he pulls it down, the amos will make like a hood. Also, when you receive the minor, uh, when you receive the order of subdiaconate, the bishop will uh, vest you in the amos. And at that time, too, he will vest you as if it were a hood. You place it on your head, and then he pulls it down afterwards. A hood <clears throat> Where is it? symbolizes the helmet of salvation. So as St. Paul, Paul talks about, put you on the armor of truth, um, the helmet of salvation, the reason why you wear a helmet would be to protect yourself against the enemy. And so the Amos symbolizes hope. That hope that we have, that secure hope of protection against the devil. That is what the Amos symbolizes. Next after the Amos comes the Owl. covers the priest from head to foot, covers the cassock entirely. It was, it dates back to the year four, the fourth century BC when it was worn by the Greeks. It was actually a sacerdotal vestment of the Greeks in the fourth century BC. So the priests in Greece would wear the alb at the altar. The Romans, when they conquered the world, they would assume uh, or assimilate uh, the custom of whatever, whatever place that they had conquered and they kind of um, adopted these customs in Rome to enrich their own custom. And many of the vestments at Mass were vestments from other parts that were adopted by the Romans and worn kind of as a fashion which caught on. And the senators liked the alb. The reason why they liked the alb is because it's white and it's long. If you're wearing white clothes and they are long, you can't really do any work. So, <laughs> so for the senator to wear white, and that it be long means that they didn't do work with their hands. They weren't farmers, they didn't go fishing, they didn't get dirty. In other words, they had dedicated their lives to intellectual work, work that they could sit down and study and be really wise or whatever. So that is why the Senate adopted that, that garb. And eventually it was adopted uh, and enforced by the church to be uh, the garment worn under the other vestments at Mass. It's allegorical symbolism. 
I'm sure you can already guess it, would be the white garment that Herod placed on our Lord when Herod sent our Lord back to Pilate. Our Lord sent, uh, Herod clothed our Lord with the white garment because it was from the Senate. And if you were running for office, if you were running for um, a place in the Senate, or if you were going uh, as, as a candidate for office, you would wear white for that same reason, because you were a learned person and you didn't do any work, you were dedicated to the law and so on. So that's what the candidates would wear. And since our Lord was claiming to be king of the Jews, Pilate, uh, Herod thought it was a good joke to dress him up like a candidate for the king's office and send him back to Herod uh, and send him back to Pilate in that way. So that is what it symbolizes. As far as the moral signification of it, it covers the priest from head to toe, totally white. It symbolizes purity. And um, it, symbolizes, it also symbolizes innocence. It's interesting, again, it is made out of linen. It has to be made out of linen. It can't be made out of polyester. Um, it's made out of linen. Linen is not naturally white. Linen needs to be whitened. And the way it is whitened is by washing it many times in bleach and leaving it in the sun so that the sun can whiten it by the rays of the sun. So also, the priest doesn't become pure just by, by himself. He needs to do penance, and he needs to expose himself to the rays of, of divine grace. So the grace of our Lord makes him pure, and penance makes him pure, just the same way as linen by itself doesn't become white. It has to be exposed to the rays of the sun to become white. Next we have the cincture. The cincture should be made out of linen. It can also be made out of wool or silk. And it can actually also be made the color of the day. So if the vestments are green, you can have a green cincture. If the vestments are purple, you can have a purple cincture. Otherwise, the default is white. And it's always perfectly OK to wear white. It's actually correct to wear white. And it's actually correct that it be linen. This is linen. They're hard to find, linen. Um, It symbolizes girding your loins and you tie it about you like so. It's got a very easy knot, which every priest says, well, how did you just do that? And each priest ties it differently, slightly differently. And, it, and the knot is taught by tradition. So depending on the priest in seminary that taught you how to tie the knot is how the priest will tie the knot. And there's three or four different ways to tie the knot, and the priests will do so differently according to how they are taught. So that's kind of neat. It's one of the traditions handed down, priest, priest to priest, um, according as you learned in seminary. And you had to have a priest in seminary teach you how to do it. It's not a textbook thing. It's not written in a textbook how to tie the cincture. You've heard the expression in the Bible to gird, to gird your loins. So St. Peter, he is sleeping in the prison and the angel appears to him and says, get up, gird your loins and we're getting out of here. And so Peter gets up, he girds his loins and he's half asleep. They get out of prison, the chains fall off, um, goes past the guards, gets out into the street, walks a few blocks and the, and the angel disappears. And then, out, then St. Peter realizes that actually that was for real, that the angel actually did free him from prison. Um, the Jews would gird their loins when they ate the Passover. So what does all this mean? Well, the white garment is long and flowing, and it's white. You can't do work with it. However, if you want to do work, you need to tie it up so you don't have all the flowing cloth and it can be brought in, and then you can do some work. So there's three kinds of people that would gird their loins. The first would be the workers. The second would be soldiers. So you can't really fight a battle with all this cloth flying around, so you want to tie it up so that you can fight the battle. 
And the third would be pilgrims. Uh, you would gird your loins before you would go walking from town to town. What does it mean? The allegorical meaning would be the chains and the ropes that our Lord was tied up with when he was chained, when he was tied up in the garden and led away. And then later on, he was chained when he was led between um, Caiaphas and Herod and so on. If I remember correctly, the rule was that you were tied up with rope if you were not proven guilty. And then after you were proven guilty, you were tied up with chains. But in our Lord's case, I believe they tied him up with chains because they were afraid he was going to disappear like the other times that he was <clears throat> running. They, they were trying to catch him. Um, but at any rate, that is what it symbolizes allegorically. It symbolizes chastity in a moral way. And along those lines, like I said, it symbolizes chastity, but it also symbolizes the fact that the Christian will work for his salvation. The Christian will be a soldier who will fight the devil. And the Christian is a pilgrim on the way to heaven. So you've got the worker, you've got the soldier, and you've got the pilgrim there. That's the cincture. So far we've only had white vestments. Now we come into the colors. The first of the colored vestments that the priest puts on is the maniple. The maniple has a cross at the top of it, and it has two crosses at the base, one on either side. When the priest, places, when the priest puts it on, he's gonna kiss this cross at the top, then he's going to slide it onto his left arm. And it's going to be closer to the end of his arm than closer to the elbow. It's going to be about here. He usually has a maniple pin as well. The maniple pin is basically a straight pin. It's called the maniple pin because it's what you use to put the maniple on, uh, to, to hold the maniple in place. The maniple pin also has a really neat function in the liturgy. It doesn't happen very often. The priest will cover the chalice whenever he is not doing something with the chalice. So when he's going to place the particle of the host in the chalice, he uncovers the chalice. When he is going to do the words of consecration over the chalice, he uncovers the chalice. But he always immediately covers it back up again. The reason why he covers the chalice is so that foreign animals do not jump in the chalice. <laughs> It doesn't usually happen in today's society because we don't have that many insects or bugs around, but it is quite common sometimes in some places of the world. Australia. In Australia, <laughs> in Australia you have to be very careful with what falls into the chalice. Um, I said Mass at Ave Maria University, and the insects in Florida, in certain places of Florida, are very interesting. There's a lot of them. So the day that I said Mass inside the church at Ave Maria University, there were at least 20 flies flying around on the altar. So what do you do if a bug falls into the chalice after the consecration? You can't let the bug go because the, <laughs> because the bug has got the precious blood all over him and he's going to fly off and splatter the precious blood everywhere. Then he's going to land places and trail the precious blood all over the place. So what do you do? You, you have to kind of kill it, yeah. And you have to eat it. That's okay if it's a fly. You can, you can eat a fly. But suppose you are in Australia. In Australia, if anything is alive, it will kill you. So um, there are a lot of dangerous things in Australia. Suppose a red back spider were to fall into the chalice. Yeah. If a red back spider bites you, you have a few minutes. few minutes to live. Um, so you can't really 
drink the spider because it'll bite you. <laughs> and the rubrics also say that what if it's something extremely gross to be able to eat? So suppose you're saying mass outdoors and a frog jumps into the jar. Oh. I couldn't eat a frog. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not eating a frog. <laughs> I don't see a I don't see a worm jumping in the chalice, but <laughs> but at any rate, that's where the maniple pin comes in. So you pull out your maniple pin and you stab the little creature, and then you take him and you roast him in the flame of the candle. <laughs> You're not gonna eat him, no. But you you do roast him in the flame of the candle. The idea of roasting him in the flame of the candle is not because you want to cook the thing, but because to to get the precious blood off him. Oh. So you roast him in the flame of the candle, and then you place him in the little bowl that's next to the tabernacle. So if you notice in the church. There's a little bowl next to the tabernacle. It's got a lid on it. It's got water inside it. And it also has a purificator next to it. That serves two purposes, that little bowl. The little bowl serves the purpose of if you're giving communion outside of mass, you can purify your fingers in the little bowl uh, and dry your fingers on the purificator to, uh, to get any particles off your fingers. But it also serves the purpose of, during the Mass, if there's an accident. This is one of the scenarios, you put the, you put the bug in there. The other scenario would be if the priest drops the host at Holy Communion. If the priest drops the host at Holy Communion, the altar server is going to go up and he's going to grab the purificator that's next to that bowl, and he's going to bring it down to the priest. And another server is going to go over and he's going to grab a candle. And the priest will fold out the purificator. I'm getting way off topic here, but that's okay. <laughs> the priest will fold out the purificator and he'll place it over the spot where the host fell. And he will grab the candle and he'll put it next to that spot where the host fell. And the whole idea is that you don't tread there for the rest of Mass. So you keep giving communion afterwards, but you walk around that spot. And then after Mass, the priest will go back to the sacristy, take his vestments off, come out with a stole, and then he'll go grab the bowl from the altar and he'll come down and he will wash that spot where the host fell with three different washings while he's praying the miserere. And then he will uh, take that purificator which he used to wash the floor with and then he will place it in uh, the soiled linens in the sacristy. Getting back to the bug, if the bug's in the bowl, what do you do? Well, you flush it down the sagradium. The sagradium is a sink in the sacristy, which is not your regular kind of sink. It is a sink in the sacristy which has a straight pipe. It doesn't have a loop in the pipe. And the pipe goes straight down to the ground, past the basement, to a hole in the ground that they had dug before the church was built. And the hole is filled with gravel so that um, the water can dissolve into the gravel and uh, the sacred species of our Lord's body and blood, if it's there, can be left there in a sacred spot in the ground. So that's where the bug ends up, all barbecued. Okay. Have you okay. dropped the host, Father? What's that? Have you dropped the host? Yeah, I have. It's not fun. More than once? You feel horrible. Um, More than once? I would say it's... Um, Yeah, more than once. Maybe three times. It's not fun. Yeah. Um, maniple. Back to the maniple. The maniple, again, has two meanings. The allegorical meaning. The allegorical meaning is the... Nice word. Fetters. In other words, the handcuffs. That our Lord's hands were tied with when he was a prisoner. And the moral meaning, where is it? Oh, the history of it. So this was used by the Greeks as a napkin. So your waitress, when she comes around to you in the, in the restaurant to clean your tables, usually they have like a 
rag here. Sometimes I have a rag here to clean up whatever. That's how the Greeks had. They had something like this and they would clean up the tables. It was adopted as a kind of handkerchief that people would wear and particularly servants. Um, but the Romans adopted it as kind of a fad that people would wear it just for fun and then use it as a napkin or whatever to wipe their sweat and so on. St. Peter. When St. Peter would celebrate Mass, they said that he had channels coming down his face from the tears that he cried because he could never forgive himself. Well, I said that wrong. He did forgive himself, but he always felt sorrow for having betrayed our Lord. I said that wrong too. For having denied our Lord. I'm sorry. So our Lord, uh, so St. Peter denied our Lord three times. Our Lord forgave him. And yet, for the rest of his life, he felt sorrow for the fact that he had denied our Lord. And so, when he would celebrate Mass, especially then he would cry. And so he grabbed the mappa, that's what it was called back then, and he would wipe his tears as he celebrated Mass. And out of respect for that, it became one of the vestments. And all the priests would wear this when they would celebrate Mass. Um, it symbolizes sorrow and contrition. It symbolizes sorrow, particularly the sorrow of um, weeping and sorrow, it symbolizes. It's taken off whenever the Mass is not going on. So at the asperges, before the Mass, the priest has not got the maniple on. If the priest is going to hear the profession of a nun during Mass, he's going to take the maniple off, he'll receive the profession of the nun, then he'll put the maniple back on again and continue on with the Mass. And at the sermon, the priest will take off the maniple, place it over the missal, and then go out to the pulpit to give the sermon. The reason why it is taken off when it's not specifically mass going on is because there is no sorrow like the sorrow of Calvary. And so since it symbolizes sorrow and tears, it's taken off because there is no comparison between the sorrow of our Lord suffering on Calvary and any other sorrow. Another interesting tidbit, it's taken off to the sermon. The sermon is technically not part of the mass. The sermon is an addition to the Mass. And that is why the priest begins and ends the sermon with the sign of the cross. It's kind of stopping the Mass for a moment, giving the sermon, and then continuing on with the Mass. That's why it's perfectly okay to not give a sermon during the week. Sometimes some priests will not give a sermon during the week, and that's perfectly okay because technically it's not part of the Mass. It is required by canon law to give the sermon on Sundays and holidays. Um, but again, not part of the mess. Extra. That's the maniple. Stick it over here. Next up is the stole. The stole was a garment from the Greeks. I mean, got what? No, it wasn't from the Greeks, sorry. It was like the maniple, but longer, and it was worn by servants. And the servants would wear it to clean up tables and so on, until the Romans kind of thought it was cool to use as a fashion, and the, the wealthy adopted it as a fashion to wear. And it, got, and it became quite popular, and it became not a rag anymore. It became quite fancy. So it became a, a status symbol. Um, and also very popular. So Emperor Aurelius would tell people in the games to show their recognition or, or fanciness of the games to, to wave the ends of their togas, whether they liked it or not.
because it symbolizes or it came, because it came from servitude, it symbolizes not necessarily the, not necessarily jurisdiction, but the use of your jurisdiction. And it is worn as an indication of the priestly office. As you know, there are seven sacraments. One of those sacraments is holy orders. Holy orders includes the diaconate, the priesthood, and bishop. It's all the same holy order. Um, but it is given in different degrees. So a bishop would have the fullness of the priesthood. A priest would have a liberal use of the powers of the priesthood. And then the, de and then the deacon would only have very restricted powers of the priesthood. So the deacon can preach. Uh, the deacon can bless things. The deacon can uh, witness at a wedding. But uh, a priest can do most everything except he can't make another priest. Um, and he needs to get special permission to do confirmation. And he needs to get faculties to be able to do several of the sacraments. So he needs faculties to be able to hear confessions. What faculties are, are basically the permission from the bishop to do uh, that particular sacrament. So the stole, the stole is worn differently for each of these uh, orders to symbolize that jurisdiction or the lack thereof. So the deacon will wear it over his one shoulder and tied here like this. So he's kind of wearing it halfway. He's not a full priest yet. The priest will wear it over his shoulders. So it symbolizes the yoke of Christ because he carries it over his neck. But it is crossed, so it's tied. His jurisdiction is bound by the bishop's permissions. So it's crossed right over left, tight. And then the bishop will wear it straight down because the bishop has jurisdiction, has fullness of the priesthood. So it's the yoke. It symbolizes allegorically the cross that our Lord carried to Calvary. And the moral signification of it it has a threefold meaning the first as it rests around the neck it represents the yoke of Christ inasmuch as it is a garment of honor uh, it represents the robe of innocence required for the worthy administration of the spiritual office or the garment of sanctity. <clears throat> and finally, it is the garment of glory with which the faithful servant will be clothed as the eternal reward. The prayer that you say when you... So I've been skipping out these prayers. Sorry about that. The prayer that you say when you put on the alb is purify me, Lord, and cleanse my heart so that washed in the blood of the Lamb, I may enjoy the eternal bliss. When you put on the cincture, you say, Gird me, O Lord, with the girdle of purity, and extinguish in me all evil desires, that the virtue of chastity may abide in me. And when you put on the maniple, you say, Grant, O Lord, that I may so bear the maniple of weeping and sorrow, that I may receive the reward of my labors with rejoicing. And then the stole. Restore unto me, O Lord, the stole of immortality, which was lost through the guilt of our first parents. And although I am unworthy to approach your sacred mysteries, nevertheless, grant unto me eternal joy. And then finally we come to the chasuble. It started off as the garb of a Greek peasant. It was kind of like a poncho with a hood. <laughs> it's exactly what it was. It was like a poncho with a hood, and the Greek peasants would wear it. But 
the Romans adopted it. They kind of liked it. And it became, they, they cut off the hood. They cut the hood off. And they just wore it kind of like a tablecloth with a circle and cut in the middle for the head to come over. <laughs> um, and it became quite popular. What was it called? It was called the... It, it was called the Painola. And it became quite popular in Rome. So the wealthy wore it, the common people wore it, everybody started wearing the Painola. So much so that a lot of the martyrs, when they died, were wearing this. Not exactly this cut, but a, a chasuble they were wearing when they died. And so, out of respect for the fact that a lot of the martyrs died wearing the Painola, it became the norm that most priests and most bishops and eventually all priests and all bishops would wear the chasuble when they celebrated Mass. It was very elaborate. It became even more elaborate. It became very heavy. And it was very much like the vestments worn at the Novus Ordo Mass. Like very engulfing and heavy material so that you would have to put it on and pull up to get your arms out and then kind of wear it like that. <clears throat> Eventually they started shrinking it a bit. So make, make it so you could get your sleeves, uh, get your arms out easily and then shorten the arms all together. And eventually they came up with what they call the Roman cut. So there are two cuts of chasuble. The one is a Gothic cut. That's the one that is mostly worn today. And then the Roman cut was, they, they basically cut off the entire sleeves and they made it front and back. The main reason why they made this Roman cut was out of respect for the Blessed Sacrament. So particularly also when the tabernacle was on the altar, uh, you have to reach over the, the chalice and the host with all this vestment to get to the tabernacle. And there's always that danger that you might knock something over. But this will give you the freedom of your arms to be able to reach over the, the, the chalice without knocking anything over. The prayer you pray when you put on the chasuble. O Lord, who said, my yoke is easy and my burden light, grant that I may bear it well and follow after you with thanksgiving. Amen. The allegorical signification of the chasuble is the purple garment that they covered our Lord with after the scourging. So they put on the purple robes of a king and then they put the crown of thorns on his head and a reed in his hand. They mocked him, they hit him with the reed and then they took him out and Pilate showed him to the people saying, Ecce homo, behold the man. So that purple robe that they put on our Lord is what the chasuble signifies allegorically. Morally, the chasuble signifies charity. Charity is the crown of all the virtues. Charity covers all the virtues. And so also when you put the chasuble on, it's covering all the other vestments that you've already put on. It's the last vestment to go. It covers everything and it's very beautiful. Um, it's very elaborate in its artwork. So it symbolizes that charity which covers all our other virtues and uh, embellishes all our other virtues. So it's got two sides, front and back, symbolizing charity towards God and charity to our man. Love, love God above all things and your neighbor as yourself. On the back of a chasuble it has a cross. Um, the, the burden of our Lord to, to carry the, the cross. The Gothic chasubles kind of look like this if the priest were to hold his arm out. <coughs> and it has three lines like this. 
that also is uh, the symbol of a cross. And incidentally, the peace sign is the symbol of the cross turned upside down. What else am I missing? The garment that St. Paul left behind in Troas was a chasuble. Um, okay. You want to go into the colors? Or we'll yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go into the colors. <laughs> This is a Breda, and it symbolizes the crown of thorns. It has three fins and a pom-pom. Sometimes it doesn't have the pom-pom because, well, some priests don't like party hats, so they rip the pom-pom off. Um, the Jesuit Breda has like a little square piece of cloth, like, looks like a little diamond shaped cloth that sticks up in the middle. At any rate, it symbolizes the uh, authority of the priesthood, which comes from Christ, and the, the triple powers of the priesthood. That's why it's three fins. To teach, to govern, and to sanctify, which are the three uh, offices of Christ. To teach, to govern, and to sanctify. It also can symbolize the three persons of the Trinity in one God. So the pom-pom. Yeah. Okay, so that's the Beretta. Yeah, I got a pom pom on that one. I ripped the pom pom off my other one. Okay, there are five main colors. That's five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five main colors and. Four, four or five more other ones. Uh, actually, no. Rose, blue, gold, and silver. So five main colors and four other colors. They have symbolism, they have meaning. So colors, there, there's a way to describe where they get the meanings from. Like people can say, okay, well this particular color signifies this particular thing because it comes from this particular ray of light or I don't know. But anyway, so white. White is pure light. It symbolizes glory, symbolizes purity. Um, it symbolizes innocence and holiness. So it is used for most of the major feast days. So all the major feast days of our Lord, our Lady, uh, the big feast days, Christmas, Easter, and all the saints that are not martyrs, they all get white. Then we have red. Red symbolizes fire, because fire is red. And it symbolizes uh, blood, because blood is red. Um, so it is used in the liturgy for the Holy Ghost, who came down in tongues of fire. So in Pentecost, it's red. It's used for uh, the martyrs who died and shed their blood. And it's also used for the instruments of the passion. So 
for the Feast of the Exaltation of the Holy Cross. It's not going to be purple. It's going to be red. For the, uh, the votive mass of the Holy Nails, it's going to be red. Um, for um, uh, yeah, so martyrs. Okay, martyrs, Holy Ghost, and instruments of the Passion are red. Green. Green symbolizes hope. The best way to describe that would be on Groundhog Day in Pennsylvania after a really long winter and you're sick of the snow and the mud and you finally start seeing the green come out. There is hope that spring is here. So green symbolizes hope. And what do we hope for? We hope for eternal salvation. So it is used as the default color. If you go to daily mass, you don't see very much green, so you don't see why it would mean the default color. But um, if you're going to buy carpet for the sanctuary, it should technically be green. The Sundays after Pentecost are all going to be green, and the Sundays after the Epiphany are all going to be green. And if you've paid attention to the epistle and the gospel for the last several weeks now, you're going to notice that it's almost constantly talking about working on our eternal salvation, practicing virtue, uh, trying to be holy, and so on. During the time after Pentecost, we are taking the teachings of our Lord and applying it to our own souls, trying to get to heaven. And so, the color of hope, green, to get to heaven. Then we have purple. Purple is a kind of morbid color. It symbolizes penance, it symbolizes humility, and it symbolizes a certain amount of sorrow. Not intense sorrow, but more of a sorrow for our sins. More of a sorrow which urges us to do penance. And so it is used for penitential times. It is used during Lent, it's used during Advent, and there are other days too of penance. So for example, Ember Days. Ember Days are penitential days which we ask God to bless us and to bless uh, the crops during the next coming season of the year. So spring, summer, fall, winter, there are these Ember Days which we pray on Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, and we also do penance. We also uh, fast on those days, asking God's blessing for the upcoming season of the year. Those are purple. And also vigils of feast days. So uh, a lot of the vigils of the feast days have, have gone, have been taken out of the calendar. Um, but the ones that remain and the ones that were there, they were all purple vestments. The vigil is the day before the feast day, where we are preparing for the feast day, so the fast before the feast, the proverbial fast before the feast. Then we have black. Like I told you before, black means death, uh, the absence of white. It is one to show the sorrow of the church, the mourning of the church, with the loss of uh, someone's life. So you wear black at funerals. You also wear black on two days of the year. Well, actually, now you only wear it on one and a half days of the year. The, the first day would be All Souls Day, where we pray for the souls in purgatory. And the second one is only a half day now, but it was worn for all of Good Friday before. Now it's only worn for half of the ceremony on Good Friday. So on the day that we commemorate our Lord's death. Um, those are black vestments. Then we have rose. Rose is basically pink. It's kind of a cross between purple and white. So it's somewhat penitential and it's somewhat joyful. So it's worn on two days of the year at about halfway through Lent and halfway through Advent. And the whole idea is we're in a penitential season. We need to take a breather 
so that we can continue on the rest of the penance after this day and finish up uh, this penitential season. So it, it's kind of lightening up the penance, but it's still the penitential time. That's kind of what it symbolizes. Blue. Blue symbolizes Our Lady. It is a permission granted to Spain to wear blue on feast days of Our Lady. And that permission has extended to certain Spanish colonies. So in Florida, it was permitted to wear blue. In Mexico, it's permitted to wear blue on feast days of Our Lady. Then you have gold and silver. Gold and silver have to be, oh, so I missed, some, I think I said something, but all the vestments need to be made out of pure silk. You can't make them out of cotton. You can't make them out of polyester. They have to be made out of silk. The gold and the silver have to be real. So you can't have yellow vestments and say, hey, these are gold vestments. They're actually forbidden to wear yellow vestments. They have to be real gold and real silver. So they used to be made by monks. The monks would take the gold, stretch them into long strings, and wrap the gold around strings of silk to give it strength, and then turn that into uh, the cloth that they call cloth of gold. So actually, if you rub your feet on the carpet and touch the vestment, you'll actually get a little bit of a shock. So it's real steel. Um, the gold can be used on big feast days to replace white, red, green, that's all you get, and blue. You can replace any one of those colors with the color gold. So at the ordinations, uh, the fraternity ordinations is past May, whenever it was. I was in the truck uh, broadcasting, but then uh, Father Lee and I came out to place the hands on all the newly ordained priests. And when I came out, I had my red stole because it happened to be Pentecost or the, the octave of Pentecost. So the correct color was red. Everybody else was wearing gold. So I was, I think I was one of the only priests there with a red stole on, but I was justified. But so were they. So gold can replace the color red. Silver, again, it has to be pure silver stretched into uh, strands of silver and wrapped around silk to give it strength and turned into cloth, uh, cloth of silver. It can be worn on special feast days, but it can only replace white. It can't replace any of the other colors. And suppose you're traveling and you only have one set of vestments. If that set of vestment is white, you can wear that white set of vestment for any color, just because, uh, for convenience if you're traveling, if that's the only color you've got. Um, that's the vestments.